Welcome back to Follow Through with LVB. Today's guest is Michael Bracewell. He's one of my closest mates. I've known him since probably about 12 or 13, where we, used to, where we first came across each other, both keepers back then. Uh, but no, this guy is a black cap, a Wellington Firebird, IPL, uh, overseas cricketer, extraordinaire. He's a father, he's a husband, uh, and he's just one hell of a dude. Michael, welcome to Follow Through. Thank you, Logan. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So, Michael is actually the reason it actually got up and running, this podcast. Because Mike and I are very competitive. And I don't know where it comes from. I don't know why it's been a thing for a very long time. But there's, there's one man in this world that I want to beat badly. And it's Michael Bracewell. Why is that the case? I don't know. It doesn't even have to be sporting events that we compete against each other in as well. I, I remember one time we were deciding whether to uh, whose car we were going to take to the supermarket and it turned into quite a competitive game of shooting a ball into a basket. Obviously, I won and we took Logan's car, but it's it wasn't it, the taking of the cars, not not the win. It's it's seeing seeing that look on your face when I beat you at something is yeah, I don't know. I, it is a special bond that we share and probably one that you and I only understand and there's been some different benefactors of that relationship along the way. I think of the games that of Catan that we played and Lauren was obviously a very big benefactor of that, us sabotaging each other. You're welcome, Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a it's a special bond that we share and I think it also helps us helps drive us uh, helps us drive ourselves to be the athletes that we are, I guess. Yeah, it is. There's one pl- uh, place uh, that we are super competitive, and I think you've got the wood over me of, over recent time, and I'm going to admit it on this podcast, that it's uh, on the golf course, and for some reason I can't seem to beat you on the golf course, although my handicap says that I've got a lower handicap. And, yeah, it's something that's going to be with us for a long time, and, you know. I don't think we've got enough time to dive into that relationship just yet, the golf, but hey, maybe that's another podcast that we can start, the the yips and golf. The yips and golf, I know, I know. But Mike, this is, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on this podcast, and I did mention before why this podcast got up and running now, competitive, we got sidetracked, see there, there we go, we got sidetracked talking about competitiveness, but the reason was, is that I've been telling Mike for about six seven eight months this is 2019 when i was was overseas and i said oh, i'm starting a podcast i'm starting a podcast i'm starting a podcast and i came back to wellington and i said oh, i'm starting a podcast i recorded a podcast and it was slowly about to come into lockdown and mike said to me oh oh when are you going to start this podcast i'll give you five days and then that was the fire that was the fire that i needed to get this podcast up and running. And then the second thing you said to me after maybe two or three episodes, he said, oh, um, yeah, I I, I saw this thing online the other day. It's like most podcasts only last about six episodes. And I was like, well, I'm going to show you. And now we're up to, this is, you know, we're up to, um, this would be 28, 29, where we're up to. So I actually want to say thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, man. It's funny that you say that because sometimes you can have what feels like a, a s- slightly, uh, what? How would you describe it? A uh, small moment in in your life, just a conversation, um, challenging someone to do something a little bit outside their comfort zone, and for that person, it can actually be quite influential in their life. And it's been a great podcast, um, and I'm sure it'll continue on. You're well past the majority now, Logan, yes. of of six episodes. So, yeah, it's it's. It's awesome to be able to see you doing your thing and um, finally I get the call up to be on it. I've been sitting there with my hand hand ready to go, <laughs> waiting for you to ask me. Well, but, it's it's funny because like I'm out there trying to find guests. I'm trying to like, look, for, okay, they, they got a cool story. they got a cool story. But I've got one of the, the best stories right in front of me and we're going we're gonna to dive a little bit deeper into the My- Michael Bracewell journey. And from the sideline... Uh, well, from the side, I'm with you along part of the journey. It's been so cool to to just watch it, be part of it, um, part of the highs, part of the lows, and everything about it. And it's 
it's funny some of the best stories are just around us and it's sometimes i'm like a little bit oh do i do i get these guys will they want to come on um but you know your story is a very uh interesting lots of everything about kind of sticking at it uh not giving up on a on a dream and you know reaping the rewards but then also continually get tested along the way which we're going to talk about i want to go back to back when we kind of were growing up mike was uh you were born up north yeah in macedon macedon but then you 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 spent the majority of your life in dunedin and you're an otago boy the bracewell name is uh, synonymous around new zealand circles especially in the cricketing circles uncles played father played everyone knew who the bracewells were um when you were growing up and you started to get quite good at cricket did you feel that pressure of having to be good at cricket or become a professional cricketer no i don't i don't think i did um my dad was was very good at um i'm not shielding me from from that expectation but just putting my focus in the right areas i would say um he, he was a very good cricket coach and yeah, just, just talked about making sure that you have fun, put no expectation on you. And I, I probably saw a lot of other young cricketers around putting a lot of expectation on themselves. Whereas um, your, your family's so important in, in supporting you and, and setting you up with the right values and things like that. So I think he just instilled that, that love of sport. Um, and with that, like... There's, there's all sorts of expectations that we can put on ourselves or other people can put on us, but the way that he was just he was just like, just make sure you're having fun. Another one of his uh, quotes was, don't cry when you lose. Oh, man. And <laughs> broke that one a few times. I'm sure you have as well. <laughs> oh, yes. And yeah. then if you sign up for a team, then you have to commit to that team for the, for the whole season. Um, he was a rugby and a cricket coach, and he got fed up with... Uh, people signing up for the rugby team and then there was a school school ski trip that some of the people would go okay I'm going to go on we were never allowed to go on the school ski trip because we had signed up for the rugby team and that was the commitment for the whole season not just not just for one or two games it was you turn up every time and I think those sorts of little values that that he taught me have have sort of taken the pressure off and just let you see the game for what it is which is a beautiful game where you go, get to go out and and be competitive against other people which is probably what I'm, what I enjoy the most about it mm. yeah those those expectations that they can suffocate you uh, I know I, I I suffered from you know at high school you, you you're kind of better than the majority mm. um, and you start to think of bigger things and the big thing that I definitely got um, the uh, the word or the phrase was oh you got so much potential you got so much potential and it's like my fear was always not living up to that potential for you you and Corey Anderson growing up were bigger stronger and far bigger than everyone else um, you were the two guys especially growing up that were the big dogs of our of our era did that did you know you were good or did you were you still just playing when was the moment that you realized that okay hold on i'm actually quite good at this yeah it's an interesting question i don't think i've ever sat down and thought oh, i'm really good at this and like to this day i think you always or i've always been striving to to get a little bit better and and those sorts of things i think um one time i felt very inferior was um I was playing an under-19 uh, inter-squad match and um, Jeet, Jeet Raval and I had, had managed to put on sort of 100 runs in, in the first 2020 warm-up game. And then the second game, uh, Tim Southey was in the opposition and he came in and just bowled short at me the second the second game and I, I just had no answer. And I remember um, just, just going, I haven't even seen any of those balls. I don't know how anyone could play that. And then... Mm. Um, Kane Williamson came in at number three and Southie bowled a free hit he bowled him a bouncer and he just hit it 
a million miles for six. And I was just like, whoa, like, I'm so far off the pace here, it's not funny. But I think the lesson that I learned from that was I went home, I told dad that I need a new helmet because I'm probably <laughs> going to get hit a few more times. And I just put the ball, bowling machine on the short ball and, and tried to find a way to, I guess, be able to survive for a start. And then, um, yeah, from from there, I think that sort of attitude that I took into that specific example is probably something that's done me well through my career. It's it's that not that feeling of being inadequate, but having that feeling and then trying to find a way to to not feel like that again is probably what what drives you a little bit to to be we to become a decent player and and sit in this position getting to talk on this great podcast. There we go. There we go. The lessons. The lesson of Mike. It, it, it's interesting because you're 19, well, back then you are probably 17 when you faced him for those bounces. Mm. Um, and then moved through, you played New Zealand under-19s twice, and then you played for Otago quite early on, probably 1920 as well, when you played debut for Otago. Um, so everything's kind of going to plan, if, if that's such a thing, in terms of making all the teams. Um, and the next step, next hurdle was playing for New Zealand. Or maybe playing New Zealand A, then playing New Zealand. What was Michael Bracewell at 20, 1920, when he first got onto the Otago team? What was, what, compare him, the mindset and the way you prepare to the 33 year old Michael Bracewell? What was that guy like? Great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think back then I was, I was probably quite naive as to what it takes to be a professional cricketer for a start. I think um, I really rode the highs and lows of performance. So if I did really well, I was on cloud nine, um, really stoked, all that sort of stuff that comes with a good performance. And then on the on the flip side of that, when you didn't do well, it was like I was quite hard on myself and didn't think I was capable of of getting back to those to those heights of the of the peak performances. I think as as I've grown up, um, been around the highs and lows a bit more, like you experience in a in a twelve year career, you sort of get to experience every sort of uh, high and low that there is. So I think understanding that that's just part of the game has been has been huge, um, and and not trying to get too excited about doing really well because that that doesn't define you as a player scoring a hundred or getting having a match winning in the innings. It's it's about how you how you show up the next day and for your team and try and do the little things that mean that you can be a little bit more consistent in those performances. And I think yeah that that would be if if you could compare those me at 20 and, and 33, I think that would be the biggest difference is just a little bit more level-headed around those performances, understanding that one or two in, innings either way don't make you a, a really good batsman or a, or a really terrible one. Same with bowling as well. Mm. You said the little things there. So what are the little things that you're doing now that you didn't do when you were 20? Um, training a little bit smarter as well, I would say. Mm. Um I guess as as you grow up and you play a little bit more cricket, you probably understand the way, the style that you would like to play. And I think that comes with talking to a lot of experienced players about how they do it and trying to figure out what's m- most authentic to yourself and then sticking to that style for a long period of time to figure out if it actually is your style. Mm. And then once you go, okay, this is what I'm most comfortable, this is... When I'm most fulfilled, then going, okay, I'm brave enough to do this every time I go out and play. Mm. Um, And then from a skill point of view, it's making sure that you're ticking off all the little things along the way that take care of the big things. So the big things being um, scoring hundreds and things like that. So making sure you're checking in with everything technical that you need to do. So... When you go out in the field, you can just go out and enjoy yourself. Mm. And and it's been a journey in terms of the, your technical journey. 
around and the style that you want to play because you always hit the ball hard you always um you know you were bowling to you when you're in otago especially those early years like it was just like oh my god okay here we go he's gonna run at me and he's just gonna slap it past me or if i bowl is it short he's just gonna hit there or he's gonna and then there was probably a little period where i bowled to you towards the end of that kind of your otago period where it, it was like oh hold on I'm actually on top of you here, and it, and it was probably thinking that you you were going for a period of not trusting your game, not knowing who you were, and you kind of lost that Michael Bracewell. So you played for for Otago for seven years, six or seven years, seven years, and then that last kind of year or two at Otago, talking about technique and and finding stuff. What was happening there that made me feel like I was on top of you kind of or like a bowler yeah I think it's exactly what I just spoke about the the not trusting your most authentic way to play and for me as you've sort of touched on it's it's about being positive and and putting a bowler under a little bit of pressure and if I'm not doing that then I'm not playing to my strengths other guys strengths are are staying super patient and and waiting for that bad ball to come that they can put away whereas um for me being being tall and and strong it's about and and hitting the ball hard is those are my strengths and and i've got to i guess put the odds in my favor a little bit by trying to keep playing to those strengths even even if you've had a couple of low scores and that's that's definitely something that i've learned more recently and it's it's interesting to hear that from someone else's point of view because at the time i obviously didn't know that that was what was missing but it's not until you get round and you talk to other people, you go, when when I'm playing at my best, what does that look like? Mm. And they go, well, you actually put me under pressure. You did this, you did that. And then that's how you learn about your game as well. It's it's not just a, a big journey of self-discovery where you're doing it by yourself. You, the more you can... I, I guess we're lucky in New Zealand. We play against each other quite a lot. We, we had a good relationship even when we were playing for Canterbury in Otago like you could you could get there and after the game when when the competitiveness is gone maybe in between seasons or something like that I feel like you can reach out to different people around the associations and go look critically what do you think I need to work on and Mm. that's probably more as a friend rather than against uh, an opposition player but yeah there's certainly people that you can lean on around the traps and and you have to find those people that you can trust because obviously there's there's some people out there that would tell you put you down put you down the wrong path yeah. hoping that you do poorly so well we don't, we don't like those people but yeah. it's a great point it's a great point uh andrew ellis said to me as he when he retired he was a, a canterbury cricketer played for 15 16 years his advice to me was get the information as quick as possible go to the source go to the uh, new zealand coach ask him why you know what do I need to do to make the team, or go to the, the the like you said other players or anything. Do it now, rather than wait six months or wait wait a year, and waste mm. let's say waste a year of doing something that over and over again that's actually not working. Um, just thinking that you have to do it by yourself, um, and I definitely yeah. When you're younger, you think you have to work it out yourself, but it's like yeah, find those people. So for you, how did you, how did you, when did you realize that and what were the type of people that you went to for that advice? Yeah, I was, when I was in Wellington, I, I probably carried the same, uh, a bit of that baggage over to, to my time into Wellington as well, I would say. And I, um, by chance, ha- happened to have a, um, a mentor sort of come up to me and, and say, look, I want, he, he said, Anka, Anka Bussi is his name. He, he's a coach that um, I've since put you onto as well. So Correct. you know what he's like, but he came up to me and said, do you want to play for New Zealand? And I said, yeah, I want to play for New Zealand. And he goes, okay, you're probably not going to like what you hear, but I think you have a bit to work on technically. And I said, okay. <laughs> and he goes, come come down to the nets tomorrow and we'll we'll get working on it and I was like it, yeah let's do it so 
turned up to kill Bernie Pack. Did you, did you know him before that he day? Were, he was um, the coach of my club team, but right. I hadn't played many games for the club, um, so I knew I knew him, but like we didn't have a we didn't have a great relationship at that stage. Mm. So I turned up to the Kilburnie Park Nets, um, the artificial ones, just as you're as you're driving in from the airport on the left there. Just if, classic concrete cage, yeah. like any other net in a, at a club ground. Yeah, very, yeah. Probably, hopefully you can picture it. But yeah, so we got down there and he just, he was very honest with me as to where he saw my game, but he obviously could see a little bit of potential in me because he was, he was keen to work with me. And um, I, I, I think from that point on, I just put my complete trust in him from a technical point of view. And so whenever now, uh, four or five years on since I started working with him, I I know that my technical focus happens when I'm with Anka at the Nets in Kilburnie every time we go to the same place. Mm. And then when I'm away from him, all I'm thinking about is how I'm going to play a certain situation, what the bowler's trying to do to me, where am I looking to score. So that took that focus of perhaps when I when I was at those low points in Otago and Wellington, I was very technically focused, had no intent to score, all those little things that I wasn't taking care of. I was searching for for a magic bullet to to suddenly feel it feel good again. Whereas now I try and keep my intent the same. My technique work is taken care of with Anka and then I can just go out and be free and play. Mm. Yeah, Anka, so Mike uh, put me on to Anka as well in the last year or so. You've been working with Anka for about three years now. And I knew about him, I knew about him, I knew about him. And I'd, I'd reached a point as well with my with my batting where I was like, oh man, I'm just so lost in terms of what I'm doing technically. I'm getting messages left, right and centre. You know, this guy saying, play your natural game. This guy saying, you need to hire hands. This guy saying, you need to go back and... And it was just, I'd reached a point where it was just, I didn't know what I was doing. And so working with Anka, and you, you've had similar sessions, you know, he'll get a tire out and and actually teach you how to do the, like the muscle movements into a, a drive and like what muscles you need to use to get into it. And he was actually explaining, the way he explained it was so uh, simple that it's, that, and again, I was probably similar to you where it was like, you're just so open to, getting technically something sorted um but he made the movements simple and it was easy to understand straight away changed my grip to a, a stronger kind of top hand grip it's hard to explain on a on a podcast but it's um so i was like all right cool that's my grip all right cool this is my setup all right cool this is how i'm going to move into the ball and then it was just a matter of practicing those movements over again the movements mm. and i think that it at where we are with both of our careers you play a lot around the world you play in different competitions with different teams and with that comes a different coach at each of those teams and probably a different batting coach a bowling coach so you could in a year you could be around seven or eight different coaches at each of these teams that you're playing for and I think as as cricketers sometimes we often just completely rely on the coach that's in front of us at that point so if you're seeing seven different coaches in a in a year period then they they will all have slightly different coaching philosophies the ways that you should attack the ball probably different views on technique and stuff which can get can get very tricky so I think one thing that's helped me is when when I go and talk with these coaches it's more how do you how are you looking to play like what is what are the things in in this part of the world that makes a difference when you're when you're playing in the subcontinent? How do you how do you play spin over here versus they're not big technical changes, it's more just a mindset shift in terms of maybe this is where you should look to score or things like that. So I think having that one person that I rely on solely for my technical stuff allows you to then go and be open with other co- other coaches and and pick the parts that you like and, and maybe drop the parts that you don't like. Whereas if you're, if you're constantly being 
influenced by all these different coaches then you can potentially lose lose sight of what you do well yeah and especially if the coach is an ex great or you know someone who is you think all right i better listen to that guy because he must have the answer um and it, depending what state of mind you're in or things like that i think the magic with anchor well i know I, I feel it with him is that he's so passionate that he wants you to do so well and he builds a bit of a relationship and there's no there's no um it's like a genuineness from him mm. And the and the excitement he gets when we do well on the field is like the reward that it that's all he wants is, yeah. is that's all he wants, and so that's a really nice place to be in a relationship where there's no, um, yeah, there's, I don't know how to explain, but it's that's where I, I really enjoy working with him as well. So you, you get the technical aspect from Anka. So coming to the basin, this is where we're at at the moment. We're at the basin reserve, our our home ground. So how would you go about? So the te- technical part's done. What is what are you doing at training then? What's a training day when you've got an option of going indoors? You've got an option to uh, face some bowlers in the nets or get some flicker. So what's the difference there when you go there? It's it's quite interesting. I try and forget everything that I've done with Anka and concentrate on the things that are important. So for me, it's trying to keep my head still and and watch the ball. I think. That's probably a good place to start with most for most cricketers as well. Um, but yeah, you you sort of have done your technical work and you don't want to be thinking about it when someone's bowling very fast or or spinning the ball a mile or whatever the the challenges that you're facing on the day. So I would I would say for me, all those times, sometimes you're you're just trying to drill the positions that you're you've you've been learning, but then the rest of the time it's trying to re- react to the ball and 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 make good decisions mm, mm. yeah it's it's amazing when you're in a cricket team you got guys who are 33 34 you got guys who are 20 21 and it's and it's you, you can almost see uh at times guys doing certain things that you're like oh man i've been there i know where he's at at the moment and it's it's hard to you can tell you can say to the guy this than the other well, we should do this i tried this things like that but the the thing about a career is that you have to go through these experiences you have to go through these tough times you have to go through all the ups and downs and the, the battle to find a coach or a battle to find form or all those things to kind of get to a place and some guys sometimes that happens quick for guys at 2021 20, and some guys it takes you know a whole career to to work it out um I'm going to take it back to that kind of Otago time. And this is something that I, I've, I've felt um, having coming out of under 19s. And I'm always intrigued to know how you, what you thought as well. First seven years of first class cricket, all the peers that I'd played with are playing for New Zealand. You, similar position. Uh, you had a cousin who was playing for, uh, for New Zealand as well, and Doug Bracewell. Did you. Did you ever, uh, I don't want to say suffer, but did you ever um, have a bad relationship with, with jealousy of, of where those guys were at compared to where you were at? Um, I think I think for me, I never really felt like a, a point where I'd got to a position that I was comfortable in my game to go, I should be playing international cricket. I think I played two under-19 World Cups um, and started reasonably well for Otago, but I always felt like to play international cricket, I needed there was something missing from my game, and I I didn't think I'd felt felt that yet. So I've I didn't compare myself to those guys. I think there were less guys in Otago perhaps that were were, were playing international cricket. Um, so it wasn't right in my face as much as potentially it was for you, but. I think for me, I was just desperate to try find this thing that was missing from my game to go, okay, now I can string a whole lot of consistent performances together and I'll, I'm an international cricketer. I, ne- I never felt like I was like in this place where I deserve to be picked, if you know what I mean. So mm. yeah, at that point, no, I'd, I wasn't 
desperate to play because I was like, I will get found out if I play at that level. Yeah, yeah. Just now. Yeah. You obviously, not obviously, it's not obvious. You spent seven years at Otago and then you decided to move to Wellington. And this is, I guess, this is the start of the transition into to where you're at now. What was the reason why you wanted to come to Wellington? Um, the reason that I came to Wellington was partly because of what we talked about earlier, the the struggles that I was having. And I felt like in being in a group that you had grown up with, I, I did feel like I was seen as a 20-year-old. And at that stage, I was 25. So I felt like I was a little bit more experienced than the guys were giving me credit for. But I also knew that my game hadn't really gone anywhere in the last couple of years and I probably needed a new challenge to to either go, okay, I can I can stick it out at this at this cricket thing and the international cricket's still an option or what what are what are other things that I can do with my life. So Wellington obviously being the capital, a bigger city than Dunedin had opportunities outside of cricket. Um Bruce Edgar was the coach at the time. He was also working for BlackRock Investment Company. So he was very well connected in the finance industry. I was coming to the end of my finance degree. Um, he also was a big advocate of the work-life balance. So he, he used to call it his, his double dipping. Mm. Um, Ollie Newton, who has, has just recently retired, he um, was working full-time at Deloitte at the time, like, there, there was a culture of of making sure that you're you're looking after yourself outside of cricket in Wellington that seemed quite appealing to me. So um, when Bruce spoke to me about all that sort of stuff, he said, we'd love to have you in a leadership resp- uh, role at some point in the future. That, that excited me as well. So yeah, I, I thought it was, it, it probably happened a bit quicker than I would have thought. Like, um, the back end of that, my last season in Otago, I played pretty poorly, got dropped. And I think that was sort of a time for me. That's motorbikes. We're, uh, we're at the biggest roundabout. That's the motorbikes. I've got a window open, so we're going to have a bit of... Wow, that was loud. Oh, no, it's coming in. It's coming in. Um, yeah, so the, I, I had a pretty poor back end to that season, and it just seemed like the right time to go, okay, let's just, let's just see what happens. Put yourself under a little bit of pressure, and you... You're either you're either going to go well, or you're going to be in the finance industry for the rest of your life. So, which which wouldn't be the worst option, but it was not obviously not the first option either. Yeah, you came to Wellington and you were captain of Wellington. We had a, a number of years of, of success, team success, uh, and it was some of the most enjoyable cricket that I've played. Uh, you were the captain, and you know having one of your best mates as captain out in the basin, you know winning finals. It was. It was fantastic. During that time as well, you just mentioned finance, you were working kind of part-time and, and kind of um, trying to double dip, as, as, you, as you said. And then in 2021, well, I guess your own personal performances, were the, they were kind of there, but they weren't, hadn't, like the penny hadn't quite dropped in terms of your, your game going to another level. Was the time that it changed in and around when your son Lennox was born in September 2021 because I feel like at that point your whole kind of perspective changed and we're going to go into 2022 which was just a ridiculous year for Michael Bracewell but was that in and around that time and it had been building and I know you had been doing a lot of work in terms of um, your work with mindfulness the, the, the mindful athlete with George Mumford but was that kind of time the penny drop where things started to shift yeah I think it was probably a little bit before that I hadn't scored a first class 100 in about 7 years or something like that and this, I think the season before that I managed to get 1 and then I got 4 in that season and I think that was that was probably a big monkey on my back in terms mm. of I was putting more pressure on myself because I knew I was sort of hoping that no one else knew but but I knew yeah no it was yeah well that's the thing it's kind of yeah. it's 
one of those things that we all knew, hmm. but we never kind of yeah brought was, it up. I was just like, okay, and then yeah, managed to score a hundred out here, uh, batting with Devon, which was which was a really cool moment because he had scored about twenty by that stage for Wellington, <laughs> but um, just to be out there and celebrate with him, one of my really good mates was was awesome as well. And then yeah, I think from there also I was. I was learning to bowl as well, which was was pretty new. And from that stage, I I felt a little bit more comfortable. I'd I'd only picked up bowling a couple of years before that. And well, the, just to quickly go on that, Jaden Battelle, who played for Wellington for a gazillion years, off spin bowler, uh, he retired in twenty twenty maybe or twenty nineteen, uh, and so there was a a, a, a space hmm. to go. All right, we need we need a spinner. And this is where yeah. your off spin journey began. And I'd, I'd been working with Jeets a little bit um, in the nets. Probably he didn't think I was that serious, but I was quite serious at, at trying to develop it and maybe be able to bowl a couple of overs in a one day game or um, something like that. So I was just watching him in the nets like intently. Every time he did anything, I'd be like, oh, what, how does he do that? And and he was amazing. He would, He gave me a lot of time even though he probably thought it wouldn't really amount to anything. And I was I was just bored in the nets not batting. But yeah, I think from there, and then I remember one day having a conversation with uh, Bruce, the coach at the time. I said, Bruce, can you please just put me on the bowling list? Like, you obviously get a net session plan. And I was like, I'm, I'm keen to keep improving this. But if it's just all the other bowlers and then... It's like anyone who wants a bowl can just put their name down at the end. I was like, just just check me in the list every time. I'm keen to bowl. I want mm. to bowl more. Mm. And then so from then on, every day my my name was on the list. And I was like, okay, cool. And then with that comes a little bit more expectation from the guys in the team that you're not just doing it because you've got nothing else to do. It's like, it's like part of it. And I think then we played... A first class game in uh, Colin Maiden and it was it was one of the rare wickets in New Zealand that turns a little bit and um, we we managed to win the game and I got five for mm-hmm. um, and I think that was the moment where I was like oh, I can actually I can actually do this in a game and um, then so from that leading into the next season where I got those hundreds it was someone once said to me that you're only three hundreds away from making the next team. Uh, Doug Watson actually. Doug Watson once said to me, "You're only three hundreds away from making your next team. So whatever competition you're playing, you you might be in your club second eleven. If you score three hundreds, you'll get noticed, and then you'll you'll get into the first team. If you're in the club team and you want to make the provincial A side, if you score three hundreds, you'll get noticed. Mm. And so I I scored four in that season, and then. One of the, one of those games, I scored one and then played for New Zealand Day, which sort of ruined his theory a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but then scored one for New Zealand Day, mm. um, and and so that sort of put me back in that path of being back in the New Zealand Day environment around around, uh, I, I guess yeah, just putting putting the spotlight back on you a little bit. Mm. Um, but now you're bowling, and now I'm bowling as well, which mm. which is is still very new at that stage um and yeah you you take every opportunity that you can get with the ball but it was it was pretty few and far between in in that a environment and then when i came back to wellington obviously i was captain so got to bowl a lot and at the right times as well (laughs) (laughs) so so yeah and then that that became a a balance of of trying to trying to make sure that you're doing the right thing and yeah, that that's a whole whole another kettle of fish around understanding when the right time is to use yourself and all that sort of stuff. But mm. um, yeah, so then had that season. Um, the interesting, I think, the biggest change for me was when Lauren was pregnant with Lennox. Um, there was a there was a tour to Bangladesh that got selected, and I got a call from Gavin Larson saying like. He was like real excited. I was like, okay, well, what's this? Um, there's a there's a tour to Bangladesh. We're selecting you. It's it's in September, October. 
and my heart just sank. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing news, but Linux is due on the 27th of September. This is not going to be good. It was, it was obviously around COVID time as well. Mm. So there was the 14-day um, isolation, isolation period. There were limited flights back into the country. I sort of worked for about a day on how I could try and make it work. Um, looking at all the different flights, I went back to New Zealand Cricket and said, could I do a little bit of the tour and then come back or whatever. It's just, it wasn't, it wasn't feasible. So I ended up having to say no to the first time that I got selected for the Black Caps. And I think at that point I said to myself, well, if I was only ever supposed to play five 2020s against Bangladesh as my international career, then it's okay if I, if that's, if that's all that it was supposed to be. Um, and then obviously Linux came along and I couldn't believe that I'd thought about going for a second, to be honest, mm. after experiencing the birth and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I think that whole, that whole thing put cricket in perspective for me as well. I, at that time I was working part time, um, for a finance company as well. And with with Linux being there, it was very busy. We were playing four day cricket. I was staying up till one o'clock in the morning working, and then trying to turn up and play cricket the next day. It just wasn't working. So I ended up having to hand in my resignation at Flux Federation and start this cricket journey again, almost as as a as a family. Um, and then from there, yeah, I think those little things helped along the way as you said it it was sort of around that time that Linux was born that I had a couple of pretty good games and then managed to get picked for New Zealand again but I think yes it was probably a little bit before that and and the build up to that that sort of yeah I guess changed my perspective on things a little bit mm. we're going to go into 2022 because this, this year is just a, a an amazing year um to watch you play the birth of Linux you, you've given up the, the, the job at FNZ. Um, you've been selected to a tour, but you've turned it down. Your journey with mindfulness and how incorporating that into your life and how that's helped you. Yeah, I think... Well, I, I started that in the back end of my Otago career and I, I think that's something that's always just sort of been simmering away in the background. Um and yeah it, it it is a really tough one because those those of you that have started mindfulness a little bit and then it's fallen away you, there's never a point where you sit down and and do your 10 minutes and then you go oh, i feel way better now <laughs> but after about 6 months you sort of go oh maybe i feel a little bit different to when i did 6 months ago and then that that journey just continues on and um, you learn a b little bit more about it, you do a bit more reading or whatever and then suddenly you go, oh, I'm actually a little bit calmer in these high pressure situations where I'm allowed, able to focus on the right things at the right time, like this this must be this must be helping and then even further than that it, you just go, it doesn't really matter what it gives me, it just it's just part of who I am now. Mm. Um, and yeah, some, sometimes I, I think it means that um, I'm too calm in, in quite stressful situations, but um, yeah, Lauren isn't too impressed at times or I, I feel like it, it could, this could be an excuse, but I'm watching TV and I'm intently watching the TV and I can't hear, <laughs> I can't hear what else is going on around me. And Multitasking is difficult. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I was watching TV last night. The same thing. And my wife came in and I was just like, I can easily pause it. But I was just like in, I was just watching. It was like an interesting part. And she and she came in. She said something and I just completely, I didn't even hear what she said. <laughs> you, hear the, you hear the sounds. But <laughs> and I just saw, and she just turned around and walked the other way. And I was like, oh, damn it. 
<laughs> that paused and ran out to run after it. Welcome to the mindfulness. Oh man, mindful every every day. Mindful, mindfulness, mindfulness. Yeah, mindfulness. The my I mine's uh, I guess my mindfulness is around the being present and not thinking too much in the past and too much in the future. It's mm. like recognizing when I'm oh whoa I'm thinking way ahead of myself right now or oh, whoa I'm thinking way too much in the past now. Let's just run this 1500 that we had to run today. Mm. Uh, there was periods where I was mindful, but not not so much. <laughs> We're going to jump into 2022 because this is just a ridiculous year. And a year that I was uh, as much of a fan um, and, a, and just so happy for you as well, um, having known your journey for, for so long. It, the year started on January 8th or 7th. I think it was January 8th. We played a T20 game at CD. We're chasing 230-odd, and you get 141 not out. One of the most ridiculous innings uh, that I've ever seen, been a part of, whatever, uh, and you win the game, and we're all lifting you up, and you've got your hand in the air. And that was the, the innings that kind of, well, it pr- pretty much put you on the map in terms of getting recognized all around the world, people, you know, the amount of media afterwards. What was, what do you remember from that innings that day? I remember being really calm. I think my first couple of balls came out of the middle and I was like, okay, this is like, it felt good. Um, I, I played a straight drive for four and then the next ball I like flicked one off my legs for four and I was like, hmm, this is like feeling nice. And then we just kept losing wickets at the other end. So I think that that never allowed me to, to get too carried away in that moment. It was very much like, okay, what's happening right now? I needed, everything was in front of us. We're chasing such a big score. We're losing wickets consistently. So I knew that I needed to keep my intent up for that whole innings because there's no other way to chase down 200. But it sort of never allowed me to go, oh, where are we sitting? I, I don't I don't really remember looking at the scoreboard until we needed 20 off. The, I remember looking up and going, we need 20 off the last over. I was like, oh, we, at, at one point we got it down when you and I were batting together. Mm-hmm. We got it down to only needing like 10 and over and we were like, happy days. This is, <laughs> yeah. we're going to do it with an over to spare. But um, yeah, they, they bowled a couple of really good overs going into that last over. And then, yeah, I remember looking up, okay, there's 20 to go. How do we, how do we do this? So, yeah, probably, oh, I ran Ollie out during that over. That was a bit of panic, but <laughs> managed. Seriously, managed to come out and and get off strike straight away, which which then we were able to get get the last few runs over the line. And yeah, it was it was a weird feeling, like um, very surreal. I hadn't really, I've never yelled on a cricket field. <laughs> after winning a game but I just remember yelling out like come on yeah and then you can sort of hear it in the, in the replay and that's very unlike me but I think there was this all this emotion that it was like oh it's done mm. like we've we've done it and that was that was the coolest feeling like after the game sitting there not really knowing what you had done or achieved um, but just we ended up going to a concert that night and it was cool just being there with the guys and and celebrating a a pretty cool win um and that that tournament ended up being really close which that win helped us helped us get into the playoffs so Mm. um yeah it was it was just a cool a cool experience and and something that i look back on very fondly Mm. no it was an amazing day and that like i said kick-started an amazing year where you debuted against the Netherlands in March. Who would have thought you would have debuted for New Zealand against the Netherlands? Um, I, don't, I forgot who got you out in that in your first ever bat. I don't know. Who, who got you? It was a right-hand bowler. I don't remember. Uh, bowled a short ball to a small boundary. Uh, what happened? What happened? Uh, we'll, we'll maybe save that for another podcast. But no, but the, you, you went on to debut for New Zealand in, in March. You'd done it. Your debut for New Zealand. Feelings around kind of 
finally do it or was it just like a kickstart of like all right let's let's begin i think i was very fortunate that there were a couple of new zealand 11 games before that and a few like against the netherlands and i was able to do like reasonably well in those games and then when i went to to my debut at the mount i'd played literally played against the opposition that we were playing three or four days ago mm. i'd played a game at the mount before i played with everyone in the new zealand team that i was playing with at the time before i'd played against the opposition before it was sort of like the only thing i hadn't done was was sing the national anthem and wear the clothes mm. um so doing that was obviously very special but i quickly when i was out in the field i, I remember thinking oh I went through all those things and I said, I've, I've done this before. So it wasn't it wasn't like I hadn't played at the venue, I'd never played on TV, mm. hadn't played against this opposition, I didn't know what they were going to do. Everything was sort of out in front of me. I was, I was fortunate for that. And obviously I'd played 11 years of first-class cricket at that stage, so I knew what I, what I was about as a player, what I wanted to do. So then it was just, you can either... It wasn't... At that point, I wasn't like, oh, I've made it. I was like, if this is this is it, and I'm, I'm going to try to be the best international cricketer I can be. And so it wasn't like a feeling of satisfaction that I'd done, achieved something because it was, I, I very much saw that as the start of something special rather than the end of something. Mm. And it was. It, it was the start of something very special. You went on to, to make your test debut at, Trent Bridge against England, the start of Baz Ball, uh, the baptism of fire bowling to some of those guys at, at Trent Bridge. You went on to make your T20 debut as well uh, in the same year. You had an amazing uh, ODI win, 127, not out against Ireland to win out of nowhere. Again, probably needed, I think you needed 20 off that, over, off that last over as well. You have, you know, continue, come back to New Zealand, play test matches, ODIs for New Zealand. Uh, you play and have an amazing, so everything's going amazingly well. And you end up playing IPL in 2023 with, you know, Virat Kohli, you know, you're now amongst the big boys. What's your kind of review of that whole year that you kind of look back on? Did it go quick? Did it go slow? Was it, what was the biggest, like, eye-openers? Just what happened that, that just, yeah, sorry. Uh, what was, yeah, what was some of the biggest eye-openers, some of the biggest learnings that you got from that year? Because it was just an amazing year of cricket. Yeah, it was an interesting time because for my test debut, I, I initially was only in the, the 20-man squad. And then from there, while the IPL players were away, we had a big squad and then it got cut down to 15 for the actual test series. And so I initially wasn't going to be part of that 15. So I was just in the group having fun. And then um, there was a couple of injuries in the group. So they said, can you hang around for a bit longer? I was like, okay, sweet. And then in that first game, unfortunately, Colin de Gronholm got injured. So they were like, can you stay on for the for the rest of this the time in England and I was like okay and then the, the evening before the first uh, the second test we got a message at 10 o'clock saying that um, Kane had COVID everyone come down and test and I was like okay so we went down and tested got back to my room and there was a knock at the door straight afterwards it's like um, you're going to be making your debut tomorrow <laughs> I was like Ooh. okay and then so that happened and then there was a tour of Ireland, but after that there was a tour in the West Indies, and it was Ireland, Scotland, Netherlands, a big a big tour, and the squad for the West Indies hadn't been picked yet. So it's like, okay, if you go all right, and in this first part of the tour you might get a little bit longer, go away to the West Indies as well, and then was fortunate enough to get on that series, and then it all just sort of worked like that. It was it was really random that. It was just like there's this little group of games in front of you that you focus on and then if you take care of that then something else cool might happen and that was the same with the IPL. Um, 
I, w- I was un- unfortunately Will Jacks got injured which became an opportunity for me to go there so I only found out sort of 10 days before I left that that was even an option and then it was only really locked in a week before I left so I didn't have a whole lot of time to stress over any of those things it was very much just like where am I today like what what's in front of me and then we're on to the next one mm. and you're flying you're flying yeah. you're feeling great you've now uh, got a gig for Worcester playing the the blast you've got the 100 gig coming up there's the the cricket world cup in 2023 and so everything was just coming coming up Michael Bracewell <laughs> suddenly sounded a bit like that as well suddenly yeah during a blast game uh, in 2023 you hit the ball you set off for a run and you snap your achilles that now puts you out for six seven months and now suddenly the cricket world cups probably off the cards the hundreds off the cards you know things that you've you've dreamed of playing have now kind of just gone whoa okay that wasn't in the plan what what you know what the hell's going on here take me back to that kind of moment and like now that you're a year on not even a year on maybe 12 months on you Achilles is back and you're back well somewhat playing um what was the mindset what was going through your mind in that kind of that day the week's months leading after that realization that like I've got a long rehab ahead of me I'm missing cricket I've just had an amazing year um th- this is my time I've waited 12 years to to play this stuff and then suddenly the the, the cricketing god said you know what we're just going to test him one more time hopefully it's the last time I get tested but <laughs> um at at the time of injury I obviously didn't know one what the injury was or two what the rehab would look like. Um, if I had known that at the time, I, I think it would have been a lot lot tougher mentally. Uh, but I, d- I just sort of, that first week, I'd, I didn't have any scans or anything. I had, it happened on a Friday, so the weekend was, it still, it was, it was the suspected Achilles rupture, but it wasn't confirmed. So then I had a meeting early the next week with a surgeon down in London and then I think that was the moment where he said like yep yeah, it's definitely ruptured like we got the scan um you're in for surgery on Thursday and I was like whoa like okay this is a lot more real and then you the next question is like okay when can I play again and they say seven to nine months and you go Ooh. and then you think about all the things that you have coming up and all the things that you're potentially not going to be able to go to anymore and I didn't think at that point I wasn't thinking about what work would entail to get even to like strengthen the calf and the Achilles to get back to a point of playing it was very much like oh, these are the things that in front of me have suddenly been taken away and then you get into having the surgery you obviously on crutches and a big moon boot and all that sort of stuff and from there I think that's where the challenging part starts of going okay we've got nothing to do for the first couple of weeks and then slowly builds up and suddenly you're able to do it a little bit you're able to walk with the moon boot on and instead of being on your crutches all the time and I think for me all those little milestones were were really helpful along the way it's a bit like we've talked about before with there's a tournament coming up but if you only if you focus on what you do today then that bit will take care of itself and then you move on to the next step and that's sort of how I attacked my rehab as well. I had a really, really good group medical team around me that allowed me to have these little milestones each week. Um, Matt Long our strength and conditioning trainer in, in Wellington was, was there through it all. All day, every day, yeah. three sessions a day. Yeah. Some people couldn't believe how long this rehab took. <laughs> Some people, Lauren. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so 
We were just in there, in there grinding, basically. Um, lots of isometric holds, lots of calf raises. And then each week it got just slightly better. It, was, it wasn't a day-by-day thing. It was definitely a week-by-week thing. But as, as you just started to take off these milestones, by the end of it, it actually went reasonably quickly. You're sort of like, oh, I've got a game next week. This is like, am I ready for this? Like, mm. And then, yeah, it was, it was great to get out and, and play again. And I guess the time off from the game, I also looked quite reflectively on the period that had been and was trying to figure out what I need to take into my game moving forward to come back a better player than when I left. So I did quite a lot of work um, on my batting and bowling to make sure that when I was coming back, I wasn't just the same player that left. I had improved my game through this time. And um, so I really, I've worked really hard on my power hitting to, to try and really elevate and accentuate that point of difference of mine. So hopefully when I come back again now from this uh, pinky finger, which sounds, well, that's, ridi- yeah, sounds so, ridiculous. I know. So, so Mike, this is just ridiculous. How he spends seven months, and I, I watched him for the last few of those months and kind of saw the back end. I didn't see the first kind of three or four months. Um, and he's back. The beast is back. The beast is Michael's nickname. Um he was back. Everyone was, was super excited. We'd seen all the work that you'd done, um, and you came in, and you were exactly that. You were you had got better. And I remember we had that conversation early on, where it was like, "Be a better player than you were um, beforehand." And it was. Everything was like, "All right, this guy looks strong. He's hitting the ball hard. His bowling just as well as he had bowled before." And then he fields a ball at cover, and he somehow breaks his little pinky the most <laughs> random little injury in the world that's you've got this little tiny cast on him right now um and it puts you out for eight weeks like come on you must have gone home and gone it just like it's just like uh um Shawshank redemption when he finally gets out of the other thing he's in the rain he's like why <laughs> did you like or in the shower what was like that what like yeah. What? That was pretty gutting. Um, yeah, I, I guess the resilience piece that I learnt from from the Achilles was then suddenly put back into testing again for yeah. for this little one. And it, I think after coming off a a seven month layoff, you sort of it's not any easier to take when it's t- only two months, but it's like that's pretty much the end of the season. So. Yeah, it is. It's obviously frustrating, but I think I was able to quickly uh, put my focus into okay, this is this is my reality. It's no, there's no point feeling sorry for myself or um, or any of that carry on. I've just got to go. Okay, what are the things that I can do? So, was fortunate to be able to play the last the last game um, for Wellington before the surgery. Um, managed to get out and play around the golf before the surgery as well. Mm. Um, and then it was like, okay, you have the surgery and now, you, now you're on the road to recovery, making sure that you're doing all the squeezing of the cones to make sure that the, the <laughs> movement's slightly coming back and and then going, okay, what, what can I do? Um, it's obviously my left hand, so I can still bowl, which is, mm. which is quite fun. So had a good bowl today against... Um, Tom Tom Blundell as he's heading into this uh, test series so uh, yeah you, you quickly just focus on okay what can I control how can I come back come back better again mm. no man it's um, yeah it's it's um, this game is so brutal it can be brutal on, on the field but it can be brutal in the sense of you know just when things are going well it just finds a way to to test you um, so your resilience is strong, you know, your ability to bounce back is strong, your game's in a, in a great place. So moving forward, you've got, you've got five or six years longer, however long you want to play this game. What's 
moving forward, what do you want to what do you want to achieve, or what do you want to get out of um, your cricket career? What's something? What's some things that you are kind of like? All oh, right, I would love to do this or that, or what? What's how do you kind of see your career moving forward? Mm, that's a good question. I I generally don't like to get too far ahead or or picture something and go, okay, this is if I did this, I would I would be amazing. It's, for me, it's more about um, focusing on the little things that are in front of you. And so my focus now is to get back and hopefully play these last couple of games for Wellington um, and then put yourself in a position to be able to be selected again for New Zealand. And then from there, it's about me trying to play, like we spoke about earlier, trying to play the way that I know is best for me to play which is also most fulfilling for me. Mm. Um, and th- that's when, if I if I was able to do that, I know what with whatever came along or didn't come along, I, I could hang my hat on that and go, when, I've, when, I, when it's all said and done, I'm, I'm comfortable with what's happened. I'm, I'm proud of the way that I went about things and I gave it my best shot. So, yeah, that's, that's really my focus now is, is not, going to a World Cup or doing this or scoring X amount of hundreds or whatever. It's more, did I did I stay true to the things that I know worked? Did I keep turning up when things were tough? Did I give it my best shot? Did I help my teammates out? Did I not cry when I lose? Like all those, Thanks, Dad. All those little things that when you sign up for the team, make sure that you're there the whole time, like, those things that have been instilled with me right from right from when I was a little boy, those are the things that I know that if I take care of those, then everything else will be okay. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, what you achieve and uh, hopefully we've got many more years playing together uh, and maybe even playing some, uh, some tournaments in the future together. So your career, career's finished. We're now, we're, we're 40-year-old Michael Bracewell, uh, you've decided to hang up the boots. I know the answer to this question, <laughs> but I'm I'm intrigued to to know your answer. What is Michael Bracewell going to do after cricket? Where where is he? What is he doing? Yeah, I know what you're going to say, but I I I've I've got a finance degree outside of outside of cricket, and I think for me. It's not about having this bit of paper. It's it's sort of what it represents that you've actually got options. Um, I, d- I don't think I want to get back into cricket purely because it's my only option. And I think having having something outside of cricket, like your degree or um, your education, like whatever sort of education that you, you choose to do or um, some work experience outside of cricket, it just you it just allows you a few more options so i don't really know what what that would look like at the moment um i'm sort of investigating a little bit more around uh, financial advice and and what what the industry look likes looks like um what would what would you do on a day-to-day basis would i enjoy that style of um lifestyle and and things like that so I get. I guess as as cricket as you at at times you're quite time poor, but at other times in the off season or you you're at home for a little bit, you you have a bit of time on your hands, or if you're injured. So when I was injured, I was able to do a little bit more study and step towards being a registered financial advisor. But um, yeah, uh, who knows what it what it looks like at this stage? But I just want to be in a position where I can. I get to choose what the path is that I take. Mm. That's a fantastic answer because career transitioning is something that I do ask a lot and talk about a lot because it, it is one of the hardest things for for sports people is that you spend you know twenty years committing yourself to a, a craft, a sport. Everyone has a range of um, successful careers. Let's say successful careers. Some some of the lucky few can set themselves up for life where they don't have to worry too much about 
you know, the finance financial side of it. Uh, but for a lot of it, it's, it's trying to find something that um, that you're passionate about, and actually just fully committing to 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 that, and and that you get up and you go, wow, I'm excited to do this, regardless of how much it's paid. That's all obviously the dream. Um, the answer that I was hoping you were going to say was 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 going to be a coach, because your naturalness that you have with relationship building with guys in the team the the willingness to to help guys uh with their batting with their mindset with you know how they're going it just it's, it comes off you so naturally and then i can see how passionate you are about helping those guys the the experience that you've had coming back from injuries going through different techniques having to stay true to yourself and keep turning up and finding a way to to play for New Zealand and play international cricket. There's just so much in that pot of you that I just I go, this guy is just gonna be an amazing coach. And he's gonna be, and he will will help so many people and and uh help so many teams. Already the guys most of the guys in the team use you as a kind of batting consultant already. So I, I understand you love the options. I understand the finance is, is uh, where you're thinking and, and maybe, it, maybe it is. But I think I have a funny feeling that the game's going to draw you back in. I'm, gonna, I'm just predicting, but I just have a funny feeling that you, it just, I kind of see you at your best when you're in and around doing that. Um, but that's for, that's for future Mike uh, to worry about. At the moment, he's uh, he's got plenty more to give on the cricket field and entertain people all around the world and hit the ball very very hard. Um, and you know, we could we could keep going, we could keep speaking. I feel like we're only scratching the surface of of your knowledge. Um, but it's thank you so much for for coming onto the podcast. Uh, it's taken me a while to ask you to come on, but I'm so glad that we're. We're finally here and, and, and got a wee snippet of, of Michael Bracewell. I would love to do it again and, 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 you know, at some point in time and we can, we can discuss a few more uh, topics a bit more specifically. But, Mike, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Lowe's. I know some of those nice things that you said about me would have been pretty hard to, t- to say, particularly the golf stuff, but yeah. <laughs> All, all for the podcast, I guess. But yeah, thanks for having me. It's been really enjoyable. I'm just glad you don't have a podcast, that we're not <laughs> having to compete. Who's got a better podcast? All right, man. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, Lex.